that happens automatically. Okay. Do you hear me or not? Yeah. You hear me. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, for those people, indeed, everybody in the last session will repeat some of the things that he's, uh, he said before. The nice thing is that I will talk about something new, so that's quite nice. So there will be almost no um, repetition except for some of the, uh, the starts. Um, for those who uh, were not there yesterday, this is a picture of me in my early 80s. That's me. I have, a, I have absolutely not a problem with fertility in my uh, family. We uh, are typically Flemish people. We breed very easily. <laughs> so, uh, and that's me being thrown in the corn side. It's at that stage. But what, my, uh, what you might notice is the... So we had a... This is a, a, a picture of... Um, uh, that was taken from a, a, a dia, we say. So um, that's why the color is... This one is supposed to be brown. So my family was milking the uh, older, typical Flemish uh, animals. Very ugly picture. Milk production, 16 kgs per day, 40 liters max. My, uh, my grandmother, she unfortunately died, but just before I did my PhD defense, she explained me a number of bottles that she was milking from these animals. It was quite nice to hear her and, and, and have that expressed. So, and if I would ask her, what's a good animal on, the, on your farm, even though it might, might, for her, be a bit strange that I would be talking uh, to, to her like that, she would have said this, yeah. She would have said, a good cow calves easily, produces a lot of milk, um, gets pregnant quite soon and stays healthy. Now, this is 217. I've, some people have shown these animals as well. World record productions are um, really getting uh, enormous. This is now the second one. It's not the first one. Uh, this is uh, funny to know. Her name is Hartje Meijer Bacon. So she has some Dutch ancestors. Um, so she, she, she really has some Frisian still. Um, but if you look at it, it's massive what she's doing in one lactation in one year, uh, 35,000 uh, kgs. So the whole production, um, let's say the, the engine in there is of an incredible level at this stage. Yeah. Of course, um, you can think about lifetime achievements. This is a funny animal because her name is Smurf. So uh, she lives in Canada and has, at this moment, I think, the Guinness Book of Records with it. Uh, 200,000. She's also uh, an excellent animal, uh, but I do think there was some photoshopping on the uh, upper <laughs> thing. So she produced about 200,000 kilograms of milk at this stage, um, and as, as in the Guinness Book of Records. She has a Facebook page, and in that Facebook page, you can even find her number 10 that was born. Um, people are quite proud about what she's doing. Of course, this is one animal. Who, but just to give you again, this is what we we are heading to in the future, we will have animals that are able to do it. I don't know if it's good or bad, but they, they have the genes somehow to do it. Yeah. So at a certain moment, if you think about what has changed ever since, most farmers will agree, I think, that nothing has changed. Yeah. So the, the reality, on the other hand, shows, and I've shown this graph to many people, is that indeed milk production in, uh, in most countries has gone up. Most, unfortunately, most of the people plot, again, also the calving interval in there that goes up. Um, what I wanted to say is that the, the difference between what we see in genes and what comes out at herd level is very different. And it all comes back, by the way, this is also, uh, I wanted to show some uh, Belgian blues, so I always show them because we are about a bit lower because we also have some uh, dairies that still milk Belgian blues. And I found one day Belgian blues in the Netherlands, and you should not house them like that. That's for sure. That's when they don't do well. Um, but what I wanted to show is the distribution effect. Yeah. So distribution of 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 animals uh, or of, of herd herd level uh, milk production. So we have that eight to nine thousand kilograms. And and the question is, of course, what are these herds doing? So at a certain moment, I, I decided to to um, email all these people. Yeah. So all the people who are in what, what we say top 20 in production in Belgium, I emailed them and I asked them some questions. It's quite funny. But I also asked them to their fertility. And so what you see here is every dot is one of the guys who answered. This is a very small study, very small and, and has absolutely no relevance, especially given what I do normally with a lot of big data sets. But what I asked is give me your, um, what's your, what's your uh, calving interval 
Yeah, and then this is their production level. So for example, the average of that group was about 11,000 kgs. Yeah, and then I asked them, um, so what's your uh, um, calving interval in days? And then you can read it over here. The only thing what I can, this is a small study. Again, it has no statistical uh, significance at all, but I hope you observe that especially the ones who are in the upper quarter, yeah, those are the ones which have the lowest calving intervals. Yeah? And that's the interesting part. And these producers will tell you, okay, that's true. But the funny part is, I also, and this is something that I talk a lot to about dairymen, I also, so I ask them what's your calving interval, but I'm always a bit tricky if I ask something, I always want to be sure, so I also calculated it from their records. And the funny part is, you see the difference in what they said and what I observed. So these guys, for example, who had the worst calving intervals, they were also lying the most. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, reality is what it is. Reality is, a, and I showed this in other sections as well, reality is genes that go in and come out by a, a number of bottlenecks. Yeah? So your milk production genes pass by bottlenecks. Question is, is it reproduction? That might be limiting. Is it transition? That might be limiting. What's number one? My whole life, I guess, I will spend by really ranking this kind of things. What do, does this farm has to do at this stage? That's, what's, that's when you're a good consultant, that's when you're a good researcher, ranking these bottlenecks. Yeah? And transition often will be. Yeah? Because transition is a bad one. And transition is in, in, in that one a bad one that it has that domino effect. Yeah? It will have an effect on different stages, and if one drops, most of the others will drop as well. I'll show you a study that I did for my PhD work. So we went to a transition management facility because I had the idea that there was quite some uh, literature missing on, on, on the effect of a tra uh, um, transition disease on milk production. We went to Germany in a larger facility with a transition management uh, facility, which is over here. So and what we did is we looked at what's a healthy lactation. And I did some um, lactation curve analysis on top of it. And the funny part is, and so every time you see the green, that's the healthy one. We looked, for example, in milk fever. And if you, the funny thing is, if you observe animals with only a milk fever, yeah, they tend to produce with a higher peak and do the same exactly like what the healthy animals are doing. Um, but there's a but, and that's when you have this, the green line, when it's complicated by something else. So if you have a milk fever in this study, and it's followed by something else, which is a metritis, a mastitis, an, a DA, whatever, then you really have the drop. But the strange thing is, and I'm now working on the repro uh, data as well, if you look at the M305 at the end, it's almost no different in many uh, metabolic disease in our study. Yeah? The one that would have a dramatic effect, and it comes back to reproduction as well, the only one um, um, disease that really pushed milk and did not recover at the end was metritis with the 500 kgs on average. You, we need, you can split into the younger and the older animals, but that, that's something that we observed. And the funny part is that we did this for each metabolic disease. You can find the study in Journal of Dairy Science. And most of them have a slower rise, something that we knew, um, the slower rise, but slower rise is, co is, is combined with a lower peak, but a higher persistence. And most of the times, if you would only look at M305, for example, as an outcome, um, they're compensated. So these diseases, maybe they are not getting pregnant as soon as, as, as they should. So that's something that we observed. So the effect on milk production, that's something that we now are looking into in, in, in different studies as well. But it's, it's something that is definitely worth uh, investigating. Of course, the whole part that it comes to the, the uh, that's why you're here, is of course the fertility part. Um, I like this one very much. It's a bit of an older study, but these guys, they took um, blood BHB um, levels from these animals in week two after calving, and then they kind of uh, made a graph that plots the, the probability of conception at first AI. And I always show farmers this one. The bad things have happened. And whatever you do, if you have a, two millimoles yeah, of uh, BHBA in the blood, her conception rate will be probably somewhere in that region. And anything that you do afterwards is post, well, it's like symptomatic treatment. Yeah? 
So a lot has happened. Many people have, uh, of course, uh, focused on this. We have, uh, on our department, a lot of work has been done by, for example, uh, Joe Leroy, uh, that some of you might know with the whole NIFA story. Um, this has um, um, been, of course, um, added up by studies like, for example, which was published by Jose Santos. He looked at, um, um, I think, of kind of, a, it's not really a meta-analysis, but he gathered also data from different farms, I think, in Florida. Um, and then he looked at, for example, if people are saying the animals remained healthy or they had a case of a transition disease or other diseases, he kind of finds that slope in, in the probability of detecting her uh, by uh, 65 days in estrus, yeah, or let's say estrus cyclicity. Um, he nicely uh, also dropped that into uh, different uh, diseases, and there's always different uh, differences in this. And this is a bit the same like with the milk production effect. Disease do have different effects. Yeah, I mean, we need to do, as researchers, we need to dive in. Um, the one which is, for me, always, a, uh, let's say, very pr well, it proves what, what's going on is the conception strategy. So what's the pregnancy to first AI? Healthy, about 50%. So if you would only have healthy animals, you would have that conception rate of 50%, what's, what we used to have. Now, one case of a disease, multiple cases of a disease, and they start dropping. The one which is the worst in this study is the clinical ketosis. Yeah? That's the one who was pushing the results the most. Again, going back to the BHBA. Uh, so in one way or another, that all comes back to the, the things that we know. Um, what I see in practice, and this is, in, is a graph that you've seen a lot today. I've just pulled this out seconds ago from um, a, a, a herd I was on. In, in practice, what I see is that a lot of people start inseminating very early, yeah, due to that whole discussion about the BRIT hypothesis and then the discussion about the, uh, the, the egg should be, um, should be, uh, that, that should be, ha should have grown in the dry period. What I see a lot in Europe uh, is now people start being very, very early in inseminating animals. Um, the, I don't know if there's other researchers that might have a better opinion, but I don't think it's useful to really start breeding, especially older animals who have not the uterus who's ready in that early, I don't know, for example, 25 days, it doesn't make sense. But you see it very often that people, because we, they all hear these stories about BHBA influencing the egg and then NIFA, but also watch out because early can also be uh, too early. Um, so that's the kind of the thing that, that is right now, um, that, that's happening, let's say, in the field of What's the effect on production and what's the effect on, uh, on, milk, uh, on, on fertility? Um, of course, you have that culling rate discussion. What I would like to do is there's a lot of simplicity when we're talking about uh, culling rates. Um, longevity is something that in Europe is much more actively discussed. But I like this um, um, Albert de Vries view at a certain moment. If you have the time, please look at the article where he talks about cow longevity. He nicely explains culling rates is very dependent on the economic situation. Yeah? If beef prices are high, why should you not cull? But culling rates, if we want to improve longevity of the animals, that's something that is very difficult given the fact that producers will always, I hope, yeah, be more economically thinking because you should cull when beef prices are high, high and milk prices are yeah, this or that. So always watch out with simplicity. The one thing which is true is that we should, and that's nicely said, we should try to avoid that we cull her very early. That's for sure something that we need to focus on. But making, for example, we should have the, have the, old, the, the, the animals should, live more, should have more parities, that's too simplistic. Yeah? There's different and better metrics to, to do than just saying uh, that this is, uh, has to happen. Avoid the domino effect. What I'll try to do now is I'll try to, um, to, because this is a bit of a room with, I think, a combination of researchers and, and then also producers. The risk factors, that's what it's all about. But what we should try to do is rank those risk factors. Yeah. What's going on on this farm? What should I tell every farmer that he should do first? Because we have the tendency as researchers to show you results from a, with a p-value. Yeah? But we forget to tell you, is it really important or is it just important? And that's the difficulty because right now people are having access to internet and they Google and they see different things. But I see that producers struggle really finding 
what's now going on. And what I'd like to do first is, is give you a, a bit of a, um, and let's say, what I, I'll, what I identify as the main areas on which people are focusing right now and should be focusing uh, as well. Um, a lot of what I, I'll show sometimes will uh, refer to this study. I had some crazy students some uh, years ago, and they did um, they uh, analyzed all these farms on specific parameters for me. Uh, they worked like hell. They didn't know when <laughs> what, what was going on when I told them what what we were going to do. I never pay, paid them for the kilometers. <laughs> Their mom and dad did. Um, <laughs> I still have to be grateful for that. But this is a bit also a result of what has been done. This one refers very much to, for example, the study that Alex Bach has done, but he, has, he had this, the, the nice part that um, I didn't have a central feeding station, uh, but we, we did a lot of the analysis coming from there. But what I see, um, one of the biggest mistakes that I often see with transition management is that people ignore the biology of an animal. Yeah, it stays a dairy cow, and a dairy cow is programmed. Yeah, if you give her extra energy in the beginning of lactation, guess what? She's going to produce more milk. And a lot of people I see sometimes they try to do strange things to these animals, but if you ignore that, that will never work. And of course, there are some studies that do strange things and they bang, they do something that you think, oh, promising. But what you have to do is wait for meta-analysis. Wait for meta-analysis to come out that show these results in repetitive ways. Yeah? And that's what we need to do. Um, this is an overview for my PhD. Adam is in the room. I should maybe not do this, but um, I looked at try. I tried to um, uh, uh, limit milk production, uh, milk fat production. And if you look at what's going on at the end, if you limit or if you try to give them extra energy by limiting the milk fat, often what you see is that the yield goes up, or you see or you see no effect. And this really started to open eyes for me. We need to wait for a lot of studies to be combined and then try to find, okay, what's the, what will be the end effect of all of this? Um, this is a picture from a Californian farm. I always show farmers this one. This is what's, what will be difficult at a certain moment. When we increase production, she will want to produce a lot of uh, first milk and the, she will has, have a need for better calcium um, uh, metabolism, yeah? so or the calcium so you will need to work on calcium. That's something that I see a lot. Nice picture from the same farm, uh, the Jersey versus the Holstein. People tend to say that this one will be more, well, of course she's a bit fat, but this one is the most susceptible for um, calcium um, or sort of milk fever. But that's an area that we will need to focus because she will have a drive extra to produce, cal uh, to output calcium. So you need to be aware. One of the things, if I increase milk production on a farm, first thing I think about, uh-oh, What's going to happen with calcium? Is everybody aware of that? That's something that you need to do because it will become important. I, on ionic salts, very popular at this stage. What do I see? Often too little, often, sometimes too much. Sometimes people use the wrong acidifying um, uh, anionic, anionic salts. They forget to look at the magnesium and then they combine it with high potassium. These are things that I think, why is everybody publishing these results and nobody's implementing it in the real life? So that's really something that I, I, I hope you can take home. Insufficient water supply. This is in a, a picture from a dairy cow in the Netherlands, never in Belgium, of course. <laughs> Sorry for the Dutch in the room. <laughs> um, but this is something that we forget. We push milk, and then we say, yes, she has transition disease. No, we push milk, we forgot to treat her right, and then she has transition disease. Think about your water um, uh, the, the lines in the barn of all these older barns, the only thing that they did, the inner side shrank. So the flow of water to many, in many of these barns, older barns, is just not good enough anymore. Um, I heard somebody talk uh, some, some months ago that this behavior is trying to say, this is mine. Yeah? She's trying to tell the other ladies, we don't have enough water, and the water that we have is mine. Yeah? So if cows go up, I've never seen a study that uh, proved that, but I liked the idea because you see there's only one waterer for all the dry cows. That's not a good situation, but you see it everywhere. I calculate day and night rations, and then you come with this very decimal <laughs> uh, sensitive product or uh, tool, and then I, I hope that things go right. There's a lot of research done by Diamond V at this moment about TMR audits. We did the same, so one of the students did all TMR audits on these different farms that I showed on the map, and indeed the differences between how people feed is humongous. Yeah? 
And again, then they feed a product and they look at the, the results in research and they say, I do not see or observe what has been published. There is compliance issues, yeah? And this is not very sensitive to decimals. So you need to be aware of that. A very nice example is everybody knows that you should feed, for example, a very basic diet for dry cows is straw and corn silage. I don't say it's good or bad. Everybody tells you. What do you see? Corn silage, indeed, and then... <laughs> That's not what we were taught, yeah? But it happens. The other one is this. Look at only the quality of what's there, and then you have these heifers and cows, and, and then I think somebody calculated it, somebody lost an hour of work, and this is what reality is doing. Another one, the dry minerals who are still there. Yeah? This is reality. This is what's happening. Um, lower quality forages to the dry cows, also a mistake. Please don't do it, um, because it will impact what's going on in your transition and then fertility. Ignore physio don't ignore physiology, uh, focus on, uh, on, um, on the calcium metabolism, focus on feed management, that a lot of research should be done on that. How do we monitor that? Because the IoT promise should help us in doing that. How do we get the water supply in these dry cows uh, well enough? So that's a bit a quick overview of what's out there quite right now nut on nutritional risk factor um, disease. This one is much nicer. I dare sometimes to tell producers that I think 60 to 70% of what is going on in many transition disease is related to non-nutritional risk factors. But it's difficult to explain because it's so difficult to capture and I'll go into that. But I'll, I, I'll refer to quite some studies done worldwide. The risk factors right now, number one who is popping up in every study, so we've done the study also with the different farms in Belgium, there's a Wisconsin study, there's a Californian study, number one who's always there, that's stocking density in the close-ups. And every time you go to a barn, still you see overstocked dry cows. So then we're, I start thinking, should I now do research on the decimals or on the numbers before the decimal? So um, this is a TMF facility. To give you an idea, you can nicely see these are, they seem to be quite uh, pushed together, but these are uh, headlocks of 80 centimeters instead of 65. So these are bigger um, head headlocks because they became bigger. Yeah? Nice studies right now show that just because the genetics are making these animals bigger, they are wider. Look into pictures. I've been on a lot of dairies and I always take pictures and you always have one, two, three, four, and then there's one open. And on a lot of dairies you will see this. This is even with a, an, with a, an, uh, a younger herd. Uh, if you look at another one, one, two, three, four, five, and then hap, sh again. That's because they're telling us something. Yeah? They want to eat together, but they cannot. And then they will, that, that overstocking problem becomes a, a problem. Mattress versus sand. Although I know it's a very difficult discussion, this is where the research is pushing us to. They need to lay down. I hope that the sensors, the ice robotic people are here. I hope that finally we can move beyond the discussion and really make this uh, truthful. Yeah? How can we measure lying time, time budgets? How do we visualize that? Your herd is laying eight hours instead of what you need to do 12 hours or even 14 hours. Yeah, studies that were done in Wisconsin with the freestyle barn with sand and mattresses really show that people that have mattresses, they push sick animals into non-normal time budgets. Yeah? Um, I won't go into details because I don't have the time, but what they observe especially is that you push animals into the perching, perching situation. So if you have dry cows which are not, let's say, bedded well, you will push them into this kind of situations and then you have a problem that will occur at the level of the feet at some moment. We know there's literature out there, now we should act. Yeah? So that's the things that we should keep in mind. A nice thing, this is the Netherlands, very close to the sea. They use uh, sea sand and the, the animals can carve outside. Very nice uh, implementation. Uh, I saw some people with uh, um, deep bedded um, uh, cubicles those things really help. Cubicle size is the next risk factor that is out there. Yeah? At a certain moment, if your animals are doing this, that's a sign. Yeah? And you should not feed extra A, B, or C. You should kick out the wall. Yeah? That's the number one. The risk factor stays on top. It's the, it's the big one. 
Yeah? If you try to feed something or try to change something and it's number two, it will not have an effect. This is number one, but you need to do it at one point. Yeah? Other, uh, this is a uh, jersey hurt with uh, the same issue. Then this is the vice versa because they are too close because there's no barrier in between. Um, newborn in Belgium, they forgot to put in the barrier and now you have, they, they go in too deep. What's out there as well? This is not a, a neck rail, but a, a chin rail. Um, and she cannot stand up easily. We know, everybody knows, but still out there, there's a lot of people where you can easily get more milk by focusing on those details. One of the students, um, his job was to measure the neck rail position and then give me the year when the barn was uh, built. What you see, yeah, and I always tell people, I hope that I can have helped to advise, but these animals have become bigger. 125 is not that odd anymore, yeah, but what you see is, look over here, still we're building barns with 110, 112. Who is doing this? Yeah, these animals are maltreated. That's transition disease management, and that will influence your reproduction. This is the head-to-head uh, -head length. We know that if you're putting them too, get, too close to each other, they will not stand up that easily. They will not lay down. And still we have, in the Netherlands, we have barns that are very yeah, much too low to each other. Sorry again, guys. It's not a... <laughs> we just like to tease you. We've done... A, this is one of my highest producing herds. The only thing what I've done is I remodeled that barn by kicking everything out that hindered those animals. And this is a young animal now standing up easily, that's what you want to have. That their normal behavior, and that's also a well, from a welfare perspective, it will help her. On the number four, I want to quickly go over, because this is really not my area normally, but the, the number four risk factor is something that I hope with all the sensor technology that will become a bit more tangible. That's the whole idea about stress management. Yeah? How many times are animals moved to another barn? How are they managed in that very short period, three weeks before, three weeks after. One of the things that, they, the, that uh, came from that, for example, no, this is not the one that I want to show, but one of the things that came from it is, for example, the whole low stress handling facilities. Yeah, that's one, but of course, you cannot feed it. Yeah, you cannot inject it. It's a management strategy. And that's something which sells much more difficult than a drug or a mineral. Without due, with all due respect, because I, I'm a, I do a lot of nutrition myself, so don't worry. But I just try to pinpoint what's the ranking. That's what the producers are for. What should I do next? Not what should I do tomorrow, what should I do next? Number five is that people who prove to be monitoring very well what they're doing in that transition, in one way or another, this is a bit of exaggerated, of course, they do better. If you monitor, you can act upon it. We've been talking a lot about monitoring the transition um, animal. It's still difficult. I understand that. Yeah. Um, we've seen some, in some countries they try to do a lot of things by having vets um, checking these fresh animals. I've have, I have a farm that I do that as well. So this is a 400 head and herd. Um, and they're doing um, ketosis checks on a, weekly, uh, on a weekly basis on the fresh animals. I collect that data almost for seven years now. Um, the nice thing is that you give them indeed a tool so they can react. They see ketosis levels go up in these animals, bang, you can react. The fact is, of course, that a lot of people and vets, and my, I'm also a vet, but vets like to discuss if this one is better than this one or this one or this one. But we should not be discussing this, we should be discussing this. Vets love to analyze. It's a strange thing in our blood, I don't know what it is, and we like to discuss sometimes non-trivial stuff. Um, if you have something that, that you feel comfortable with, you will do it better. That's the thing. I don't want to discuss in you should be doing blood or urine or milk. Do it and do it continuous and do it for a long time so you can draw conclusions. I did this, or right conclusions. I did this on the farm and this is the effect. Because if you want to have an effect, for example, on reproduction, you need a lot of animals. Yeah, you really need a lot of animals. That's a, a big problem. A lot of people are still using fat protein ratios to give you an idea. This is the same 
uh, data, fat protein ratios which go up and down. This is the real ketosis on, on, on urine data. It's really difficult to get a hold on. Um, milk recordings, with all due respect, but I don't believe that milk recordings do a good job at this stage in, in, in that transition monitoring. Um, we try. Sometimes people will bring in acetone, for example, as a predictor in milk. But the bad thing is that we don't take that animal on the right moment where you want to measure her. You have too much spread. Yesterday, for example, I saw the data on the uh, 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 PAG measurement. You need to have it on a specific moment. If there, is a, uh, if there is a time effect, you need to, it's, it's much more difficult. I like this data from a guy from Zoetis who P, he did a PhD, and he did, for example, a fat protein ratio test uh, on day seven versus the first DHIA. There's almost no relationship between those two, let alone that we're going to draw conclusions about what this animal had in the transition period. So watch out, because what a lot of people underestimate is that a lot of these models behind um, ketosis monitoring, unless you are really in that short moment after calving, it's very difficult to predict that. Yeah? Um, and a lot of people do, do well, but the very good predictions that I want to see, that's 80, 90% accuracy, I have never seen. And that's something that a lot of people think, wow. I thought these accuracies were high. In most milk recording organizations, they do not achieve that yet. Although they are doing well and they're, it's an advancing, but we need to be aware of that, that you should do something. That will lead eventually to genetic process. Yeah? Eventually what we want to do is we want to breed animals that are more or less susceptible and better in transitioning. Better in having low blood, uh, blood BHB and producing a lot of milk. There's a very nice conference uh, two years ago um, in, in Ireland, and one of the guys over there, Donna Berry, you probably know him, he at a certain moment sa said, once that you guys give me the right data, I don't need you anymore. That was quite surprising because there was a conference full of reproductive physiologists, <laughs> and it was quite shocking because that room was full of physiologists and he was the only geneticist. And he was saying, look, how come that heritability in interval to first luteal activity starts bumping up and age at first calving also. But why, for example, let's say incidence of mastitis kystosis, why does it have so low heritability? He simply said, it's because I don't have the right data. It's not because it is low heritable, because we know, producers always tell me, I know the animals and I know the bulls that they go through that transition period and whoop, I never see them again. They become pregnant and they are, we know that they are out there, but we're just not able to capture the data correctly. For example, age at first calving, that's one of the simple, the most easy things to capture because you do it very well. Most of you will bring in the record of that animal she calved the first time and we have an accurate estimation of that thing. This study, for example, was done on PhD student measuring very accurately the, that progesterone activity. So, if we will have the right data, these heritabilities will start bumping up and then it becomes interesting because we can select for better animals. But you have a job as well. I, I'm, I'm hitting the, 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 hammer on the, or the hammer on the same nail again, but the data quality really needs to go up um, and then we will be able to do nice things with, with all of this. This is one of my uh, PhD students. I often compare him to... Um, to, to this kind of pictures, he's an advocate as well on the whole data quality stuff. Um, we worked recently, um, <laughs> it looks a bit like that, no? <laughs> we worked on, on very simply, I asked him, um, can you please scan every published literature so far and look for the word data quality issues? And what you can nicely see is that, so published literature, the moment that the whole big data bubble came. At that moment, people started to report more issues. I found it difficult to, for my data to be analyzed. I had this issue, this issue. So it's normal, yeah? We have more data and suddenly people start to say, look, we, we're having more issues. But what is all the data fuss about? What's the essential goal? Everybody wants to use the data to predict disease. What, is, what, what are people talking about most with data issues, the disease. It's difficult. And ICAR is doing one hell of a job right now. There's an ICAR, ICAR conference some kilometers from here. They're trying. 
but we're just not succeeding in that. That's the difficult part. We discussed yesterday as well, how are we going to solve it? We have an important job to do there. G plus E project is one of my projects that I'm uh, working on that thing. I think as a bit of a conclusion of this, what I would like to really stress is that bottleneck ID. Do I have on my farm a transition bottleneck? I think most farms have, but what's their effect on milk? What's the effect on reproduction? What's the effect on culling? And then this is the most important one. Try to identify one, two, and three. And I know some people um, are doing one hell of a job in that, and you can do that by monitoring and then trying to see a cause and an effect. Recently, uh, I start, what I started doing is um, very simply, if I have a lot of data from farms, so for example, I sh uh, the, sh the farm that I showed, the ketosis data, um, I also have a, a genetic data flow in that farm, so I know what the breeding values are from these animals. I know what, for example, the, um, the ke real ketosis levels on these animals is, and I gather a lot of information. But the problem is that that farmer is not interested in that. The only thing what he wants to know, what's number one, what's number two, and what's number three. So I do that right now for these farms. Look, for example, this is an analysis, and what it will pop up as number one is the fresh month. So the month in which the animal is calving was number one yeah, as being effective on the, or as having an effect on the outcome of the first insemination. And I really rank. Why? Because that's what the producer wants to know. He says to me, you're gathering all this information, now you're doing something back for me, tell me what I should do first. And I start ranking, and that's something that I really indulge you to do, rank, rank, rank. Because the nice part is, this is, for example, this is um, the, um, the genetic component of the fertility that I included, but over here you see ketosis is higher, and then even the discharge that these animals have is also higher. So I try to show him, look, this is what you should do. I try to work with him in a, in a ranking basis instead of trying to bring all the analysis that one. I very simply try to show them, okay, this is what you do first, then next, and then monitor, monitor, more, monitor. I've done a lot of effort on some farms. This is um, um, the result of that. Um, this one is freshly built. This is a TMF facility. I think it's one of the first that will be built in, um, in Europe, uh, uh, Europe in, sorry, in, uh, in the Netherlands. It's opened this weekend. Um, in which we, because of the whole analysis part, we tried everything, we monitored, we then changed things, but it was just too difficult to really bump, let's say, um, 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 or ameliorate the whole transition uh, problematic. And now we decided to, uh, to build this uh, transition barn totally um, according to what the standards are right now. The barn is implemented exactly like we suggested and hopefully we will see again some results over the, the next um, months. Um, it's, an, um, it's a very nice concept, but the most important part I always tell people is you, we, we analyze, you, you rank, you act, and you go back. And that's the, but that's the difficult part. Sometimes you are kicked out of the herd before you can do something really nice. But I hope I identified, let's say, that the whole transition management and the link with the, the, um, the reproductive performance I also try to show you some, let's say, basic nutritional risk factors. Of course, I forgot some parts. Non-nutritional risk factors. Monitor. I really hope that the whole industry can work better together in trying to solve this whole issue because we're not there yet. We need much more uh, work on that. But you can do things. Yeah, and that's the nice part. You have handles right now in the in the real wor world to to work. Some people ask for affiliation. Uh, you can always send me an email if you need if you. Uh, um, want more information or access to the, the slides because they, they're uh, normally out there. And with that, I will uh, give a hand to um, Adam. Uh, thank you, Mills. We've got time for one or two quick questions between speakers. If you do have a question, please raise your hand um, and the stewards will bring in the microphone. There's one. Hi, uh, James Husband. Uh, the data that you showed on the, the different transition diseases and the fact there was no effect on three or five day yield, did you take into account that possibly they didn't get pregnant and therefore they kept on milking better? 
Well, that's the, uh, everybody asks me that. That's, I have two um, students working on that data right now. There's going to be a publication, a combined publication on the culling effect. So when they left the herd and when they became pregnant. So the two things are being published, well, written out right now. So because I, I do think there's an effect, definitely. But the, but the main thing that I had in mind is that some people tend to use M305 as a, a kind of an outcome to say she was diseased or not. But that proves that it's more complicated than we, what we think. That's a bit the idea behind it. Somebody out in the loop. Thank you. You mentioned about um, number of days since carving um, in terms of first AI, and some people were um, AI in too soon. Have you got a recommend recommendation in terms of number of days that you should be first AI? Yeah, the recommendation is based on a, on a, on a very large study that was done on, on, on top of all the Dutch um, insemination data. Um, in heifers, so well, first, first lactation animals, they found, I think this is about 150,000 first AIs that they gathered. Um, when they did a, a mixed model analysis that was very well, I must say, it was, I looked at the, the analysis and I must say uh, heads off because I did a very well, good job. They found that in the, in the younger animals, so the first lactation animals, they saw no effect when you had those early um, inseminations. But the, before day 50, once you get into lactation number two, then they saw gradually that decrease. And especially, I think, from parity three onwards, they found a significant difference in those early. Um, so I will tell people, <coughs> I heard yesterday somebody saying, if she's at 40 kg, I inseminate her at 40 days, 50, 50 days. What I tell people, that's my advice, is uh, first lactation animals, I don't care. Um, but people tend to inseminate them a bit later because they have that high persistency. But if they're older, back off. Um, wait until 50 days. Um, but I don't, even, I don't see a lot of people uh, complying to that. They see the animal pregnant, they're so, ha uh, and he, they're so happy and they inseminate her. But I, if I look on the data out there and also on some farms, you can see that it does matter. So that's what I... Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mills. We just thank Mills yeah, for another excellent presentation. <clears throat>